Hello? Oh, perfect. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you also for the people who are following us uh, online. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And sorry, I will be looking like this because I have to speak in the mic. I have heard. So I will try not moving left or right. It might look a bit awkward, but I have to do it. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I, am welcome, I welcome you all to this uh, event. And uh, my name is Huria Judy. I'm a senior scientist with C4 ICRA. And it's my great pleasure to be a moderator for this uh, event with really distinguished panelists and key uh, note speakers. Uh, in my work, you know, I have been working on adaptation since 15 years. And it's my great pleasure to be actually moderating an event where I'm seeing that forests and trees are at the center of the debate. And not only for mitigation, but also for adaptation. So I'm very happy to be in this position today. We are seeing forests coming really high in the agenda. I don't know how many of you follow the discussion about the Forest and Climate Leaders uh, Partnership, which was launched at the COP here. Uh, it was Monday. And we see there that really countries are engaging and trying to put the forest at the center of the, of the climate action and climate debate. I cannot highlight enough how important forest is for climate action. And we see that in the past, forest was more and trees were more like on, adapt on the mitigation side. And as a, as a scientist, but also as a woman from an indigenous community who is really suffering from climate change, I am very, very keen to see that these agendas, both agendas coming together. Forest and trees for mitigation, for adaptation, and for people in the ground. And this is where I think we are going to move things forward. I have here today, this session is organized in two parts. The first part, we will hear from th three keynote speakers. And this is really exciting because the three of them, all of them, will present a new publication, a new paper or a report which is related to climate adaptation or mitigation. Then, after we heard about you, these scientific findings, we are going to have panelists and who will discuss these findings and what do they mean in their context. And here we will have stakeholders from different groups. We will have policymakers, we will have representatives from indigenous peoples, and we will have other scientists reflecting on that. This is really important because science alone is not enough. We need to move science to policy and we need to move to action. So let me introduce my uh, speakers. The first speaker, the first speaker will be Marake Sandka, who is joining us online. She is uh, uh, from the forestry, from the forestry division at FAO, and she is a forestry officer. So please, can we play? She actually has a video for us. So, Marike's video, please. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marike Sandker, and I'm going to present one of the three publications that are being launched today, titled From Reference Levels to Results, Red Plus Reporting by Countries. The publication is authored by the people who can see here uh, mentioned on the slide. So let's jump straight into it. Red plus reporting, like what is the objective? So the most frequent objective mentioned by countries um, is getting access to results-based payments. Um, so this also makes sense if you look at developing countries and their nationally determined contributions. Like most of the, f the forestry mitigation actions are said to be conditional on international climate finance. So considering this context, Let's move on and let's look at what we have to date. So the UNFCCC reporting to date, we have on the upper end of this line, 56 countries that have uh, submitted a reference level to the UNFCCC. On the lower end, we can see that by now we have 19 countries that have submitted um, Red Plus results, which together add up to 11.5 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. All right. 
Now, let's get back to the objective, the finance, right? So finance can come from different sources. Um, in 2017, the Green Climate Fund launched a pilot program for results-based payments, um, which, however, was depleted in 2020 um, and absorbed by eight countries. And ever since, there has not yet been a replenishment and a subsequent phase is still under discussion. But meanwhile, there's been a lot of other developments. So first of all, um, at Glasgow, Article 6 became a fact. So of course, it still needs to be operationalized, but this could be you know, a future pathway for Red Plus as well. And then we have voluntary carbon markets. So the voluntary carbon markets is growing, even though it's still small, but it's growing a lot in recent years. So in 2021, we almost saw a quadrupling compared to the previous year. All right, now let's look at the emission reductions reported. You know, as mentioned here below, you can see the 11.5 billion tons of emission reductions that have been reported to the UNFCCC. Now, how does that compare to the demand? So here you can see the, um, the already mentioned pilot program of, uh, of the Green Climate Fund, you know, that had 500 million US dollars at a $5 per ton price. It, it corresponds to 100 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Then we have the demand from the Carbon Fund and we have the demand from LEAF, which even though it's $1 billion, they double the price. So in terms of volume, it corresponds to um, the Green Climate Fund program. However, I heard last week the, by Aaron that uh, the private sector has pledged an additional 0.5 billion. So this bubble seems to be growing. Now let's look at this demand from the UNFCCC, from, sorry, from the uh, Green Climate Fund. So this has been fully absorbed by the UNFCCC submissions. Um, you know, but, and that was in 2020 when it was depleted. But in 2020 also, we saw that countries started reporting emission reductions uh, to these other uh, programs. So um, the, uh, there's five countries that by now reported um, a total of 56 million tons of CO2 equivalent emission reductions to the carbon fund. Now, not all of that is covered by the ERPA period, and also it's still under validation that these volumes may change, um, but still, you know, this is uh, some, some, some relevant um, new developments. Um, likewise, we have two countries by now that have um, uh, reported a total of 39 million, so, you know, that uh, one country subtracted what was already reported under the carbon fund, you know, 39 million tons of CO2 um, equivalent. Again, still under validation if these values may change, um, but we're starting to see um, a development here on, on this side. Um, now, there also has been the first payment. So uh, by the end of 2021, Mozambique became the first country to uh, receive emission reduction payments from the Carbon Fund, followed by Guatemala this year, and Ghana just finalized its validation and verification. So Rosalind can tell us more about that. Now let's look back again at the supply. So it still looks very large, the supply, but this, remember that this also includes, this includes emission reductions achieved between 2006 and 2021. So it includes a lot of early performance. Now, if we were to take out that early performance, only look at the emission reductions achieved between 2016 and 2021, the volume already is reduced to 3.8 billion tons. But now let's look at these new carbon accounting standards. So, um, for example, TREES or VCS, a jurisdictional and nested red standard, they require a relatively short reference period, uh, meaning that for some countries which already performed in the past, their performance now becomes their new benchmark. So we've recalculated based on the annual um, emissions that countries submitted, we've recalculated a five year um, reference level and um, the volume would actually shrink to um, maximum 500 million tons of CO2 equivalent, but probably less. So what does that mean? It means that it's not that easy, um, you know, and it's countries may still need support to actually live up to um, to these um, this demand and to actually achieve this and to 
reported uh, in such a way that it you know, would be allowed by these standards. So we need support on this quality reporting. And uh, then, you know, again, there's the voluntary market. We still haven't seen a market-based transaction. Um, so, you know, this is a, a space to watch. It's going to be very exciting. And, and we don't know what will happen with the uh, a subsequent phase of the Green Climate Fund. All right, so now that the first emission reductions payments are becoming a fact, let's see now how does this actually help countries to implement their NDCs. You know, it's a super interesting space to watch. Uh, now, in the publication, we also show some examples where countries actually used the RAT plus data to uh, formulate their NDC targets, uh, and maybe in the future they will use it to track progress. Now, in the previous slides, we have seen that the mitigation potential is strongly influenced by how the reference level is set. So all this red plus reporting really can help us to understand the mitigation potential of forests, which is of a crucial importance in view of the global stock take. All right. And with that, I give the floor back to Hudia and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mareike. Thank you for this really exciting presentation. And please stay with us because we, we need you later. So it's really interesting to see, you know, I have been working with Amy Duchel in C4 for a few years, working on to get this data on Ed Plus. And I'm so excited to see now that this data is really becoming action as the payments are now starting. With that, I will move to my second speaker, who is also joining online, who is Francis Seymour. Francis Seymour is a distinguished senior fellow at WRI, and she will t tell us about maybe something which is going a little bit beyond carbon. Francis, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Frances Seymour from the World Resources Institute, and I'm here to give you a brief presentation on a new WRI research report that was released just last month. It's entitled, Not Just Carbon, Capturing All the Benefits of Forests for Stabilizing the Climate from Local to Global Scales. The purposes of the report are first to summarize the large and growing body of science regarding the many different ways that forests interact with the atmosphere other than through the global, climate, global carbon cycle, their effects on climate stability, and the impacts on human society when forests are lost. Second, to identify the policy implications of failing to account for those non-carbon effects in policy arenas across scales. The main takeaways from the report are that these non-carbon stabiliz climate stabilization effects are significant and overwhelmingly positive, and that we are blindly taking significant risks to the climate, food security, water security, human health, and climate justice when we fail to take those effects into account in relevant policy arenas. We're all familiar with the importance of forests in the global carbon cycle, as a significant source of carbon dioxide emissions, as well as being a global carbon sink. So what effects am I talking about other than carbon? Most of these effects are familiar and biophysical in nature. First on the upper left is surface albedo. The dark green leaves of forests absorb more of the sun's energy than they reflect back into space compared to snow or bare land with an overall warming effect. In the upper right corner is evapotranspiration. Forests facilitate the evaporation of water from the surfaces of leaves, as well as transpiring water that has been drawn from deep underground with an overall cooling effect. Third, in the lower left corner, is surface roughness. An uneven forest canopy causes turbulence in wind circulation with the effect of pulling heat away from the Earth's surface. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, forests emit small particles such as pollen, as well as volatile organic compounds that interact with other chemicals in the atmosphere in complex ways. And interactions among all of these effects also generate cloud cover, which in turn increases albedo for an overall cooling effect. 
Unlike the effect of carbon dioxide molecules, where a ton is a ton is a ton in terms of their effect on the climate no matter where on the planet they're emitted, the biophysical effects of forests on climate vary by scale and by latitude. This stylized figure illustrates how albedo dominates the effect of forests on the global climate. The effects of evapotranspiration are most pronounced at regional scale, and the effects of surface roughness are most important at more local scales. And the combination of these effects, and thus the net effects of forest loss, vary by latitude. This figure, taken by a recent paper from Lawrence et al., published earlier this year, illustrates all the different effects of forest loss on global temperature by latitude compared to carbon-only effects. The left column shows the disaggregated effects of the various non-carbon pathways. You see that the loss of the warming effects of albedo dominate in the higher latitudes, while the warming effects of CO2 emissions dominate in the tropics, with other pathways mostly providing a cooling effect. The middle column summarizes the CO2 effects in green and the non-CO2 effects in blue. And finally, the right column adds both the CO2 and non-carbon effects together to show net warming or net cooling by latitude when forests are removed. I'll call your attention to the bars about two-thirds of the way down in the middle column, circled in yellow here, which suggest that tropical forests provide an extra 50% bonus global cooling effect in addition to their effects through the global carbon cycle. The policy implication is that we need to rethink the way we account for national climate action as tropical forest countries are not getting the recognition that they deserve for the additional non-carbon value of their forests for global cooling, and the forest finance gap is even greater than we thought. But this story is not just about the effects of forests on global temperatures. In fact, forest loss risks disruptions in local rainfall and temperatures that can be more immediate and more significant than the local effects of greenhouse warming mediated through the global carbon cycle. And due to time constraints, I'll focus just on temperature, but rainfall is equally significant. This figure is from a paper by Varga Zapatello et al. and uses data from Brazil and Indonesia to illustrate how deforestation makes local temperatures hotter on average and also much more likely to experience extremely hot temperatures. And it's the extremes that kill you, both literally and figuratively. When the hottest parts of the hottest days are five, six, or seven degrees Celsius warmer than they would have been without deforestation, the risks of crop failure and morbidity and mortality from human heat stress rise accordingly. Recent studies in Brazil have shown that local warming caused by deforestation was detectable up to 50 kilometers away from the deforestation event. So from the deforestation event. And they also are already depressing yields in adjacent areas planted to soy. Another set of studies led by Yuta Masuda in Indonesia measured and modeled these effects of the increased temperatures on agricultural workers in deforested areas and found the effects on productivity and cognitive ability as well as increases in morbidity and mortality. And in order to address these risks, adaptation plans to need to take into account the local effects and impacts of deforestation uh, into their planning. This slide is an example of the Venn diagrams that we use throughout the report to suggest how policy arenas need to expand to capture these additional effects of deforestation. In this example, we show that while national adaptation plans commonly take into account the likely effects of greenhouse warming on the agriculture sector, they also need to be expanded to include the effects of local forest effects on temperature as well. Similarly, this figure illustrates how typically adaptation plans take into account the likely effects of global temperature increases on disease vectors and perhaps also the urban heat island effect, but they also need to assess the impacts of local deforestation on the incidence of rural heat stress. Finally, our report emphasizes that these findings have implications across scales and across sectors. For example, as uh, 
illustrated in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, the extra global cooling effects of tropical forests need to be incorporated into global climate finance and policy arenas, including the UNFCCC. And in the middle of the slide, the role of forests in recycling moisture and generating rain at continental scales requires institutions for regional cooperation. And as just discussed in the lower right-hand corner, the effects of deforestation on local average and extreme temperatures need to be incorporated into national and local land use planning and also planning for adaptation. Let me close by returning to the cover image of our report to point out a double entendre in our title, not just carbon. Yes, we mean that we need to take into account all the effects of forests on climate stability, not only carbon. But we also mean that if we fail to do so, we'll be perpetuating injustices, widening the gap between the need and availability of forest finance for tropical forest countries, and imposing risks in the form of disruptions to temperature and rainfall on the livelihoods and health of small farmers, agricultural workers, and indigenous and local communities who are among the most vulnerable to such disruptions. And that would not be just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you for this exciting result. I mean, this is really kind of cutting edge science, bringing us back to the holistic approaches we were talking about a long time ago. And I'm very happy to see that we are getting to, you know, moving from the, different, uh, the differences between the scales and linking actually the global to the local uh, scale and also thinking how with this result can we address some of the injustice in, in the climate change. My next speaker is actually here. I'm happy Amy are here. Uh, and Amy is a senior officer at the Forestry Division in FAO. And now, after we heard, you know, from the carbon perspective, the beyond carbon perspective, now we are going to hear more from the adaptation perspective. So please go ahead, Amy. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who's here. This is the third publication, new publication, that we're highlighting today. And actually, the link to the publication itself is on the little QR card on your seat. So you just have to scan that, and you can get directly to the publication itself. Really, the, the rationale, we just launched this on Saturday, so it's really you know, hot off the press. And the rationale behind this, this publication was that, you know, of course, forests have been really at the at high on the climate change agenda for about 15 years and higher than ever as we saw last week um, but this has been so far a very carbon centric approach with the idea of co-benefits for biodiversity for local communities for adaptation and you know we also saw last year in glasgow that adaptation has risen to the top of the climate change agenda like never before, including that the Egyptian presidency at COP27 has really made this a cornerstone of COP27 adaptation. But that these two worlds were not really moving together. So forests are high for something very focused on carbon. Adaptation is high, but not really around nature-based solutions or forest-based solutions. So what we're trying to do at FAO and with our partners at the Center for International Forestry Research, including Huria, who is our, our moderator, and World Agroforestry, is try to bridge these worlds. And this publication is the first step in that. And the, 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 what we did first was basically convene a set of some of the world's best experts on forests and adaptation to try to come up with a set of principles around what, what transformational adaptation using forests and trees could look like. And, and those principles, there's 10 of them, and they're, they're in a, a scientific publication that Huria led, and they're featured in this report. And I have to say that out of those 10, five of them focus in some way or the other on the importance of communities 
locally led adaptation, indigenous knowledge, integrating bottom up adaptation options into higher policy levels. And so that was really something that came to the, the, the front of, of, of the analysis that we did with this group of experts. So next slide, please. And I'll just show a few takeaways of this report. Um, as you see from the figure on the left, you know, forests and trees are absolutely essential to helping people adapt to climate change. And this is through some of the, the, the things that Frances was highlighting in her presentation, the cooling benefits that they provide, um, the, the rainfall that they provide in certain contexts, the, the products that, you know, when, when crops fail, people often rely on the forest for their basic livelihoods. So really this, this package of ecosystem services that forests and trees provide are absolutely essential to helping people adapt to climate change. At the same time, we know that forests themselves are undergoing climate change and they're needing to adapt and, and needing to maintain their resilience against fires, pests and disease, droughts, floods, and, and losing resilience is really um, a very key concern also for the community concerned about carbon. Because if we're going to ensure the permanence of carbon credits generated from forests and forests' ability to sequester and store carbon over time, we really need to ensure that forests themselves are, are resilient to climate change. So a few of the takeaway messages, I mean, they're a bit high level and they're detailed more in the report, including through case studies from around the world that try to highlight some of these messages in action. But that, you know, actually adaptation, and many of, I see people in this audience who work very much on adaptation, we know that it's really a political and governance issue and the importance of bringing up this bottom up, you know, the local communities piece of it, locally adaptation into these higher level processes. That forest-based adaptation is and should be a rights-based approach that must address the social causes of vulnerability that those who are least responsible for climate change are those who are suffering its effects the most, and that we really need to understand the vulnerability of forest-reliant people to understand how to, how to support their adaptation and resilience. The important linkages between ecological and social diversity provides a huge opportunity. And there's a case study in this report from the Nairobi Work Program that focused on the biodiversity that forests, and gr forests provide and how that supports adaptive capacity. And, and that's featured as well. So it's a really nice way to also link the UNFCCC with the Convention on Biological Diversity as well. You know, the need for addressing uncertainties and trade-offs. Um, climate change is affecting our social and ecological systems in ways that we can't even predict and that we've never seen before. And so understanding that we're gonna see and we're seeing a lot of things that are happening for the first time and to make that part of our, our risk, our integrated risk management and addressing trade-offs, including between adaptation and mitigation. So some of the, you know, ensuring that, you know, sort of these forest-based mitigation strategies aren't actually inadvertently decreasing the adaptive capacity of local communities. And that fo finally, forest-based adaptation involves a transformation of relationships. We've seen a huge indigenous people's presence at this COP, and it's, it's, it's growing every year, in fact, and I think culminating now. And, and this is also about transforming our relationships with indigenous peoples, with their knowledge systems, treating indigenous peoples as true partners and, and, and integrating them in, into these, these adaptation strategies and plans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for this great presentation of the, the principles. And let me just say that, you know, one of our principles is really dealing with the trade-offs. And one of the trade-offs we kind of addressed in this paper is the trade-offs between, you know, adaptation and mitigation. And I see such an event where we bring, you know, different perspective on adaptation and mitigation. Is this also one step further to kind of bring these communities of, of uh, practice together? So this is a, a good step. So now we heard from, you know, the three very uh, recent and very interesting uh, publications. But we know that from the science point of view, we know a lot. But what happens then in the ground? What happens in the reality? What happens in the policy? 
how are we affecting indigenous people and local communities, how are we impacting them with this research. And in this sense, we are moving now to the second part of our event. And in this second part, I will ask distinguished panelists to reflect on what they have heard today. So we have the first panelist is Karin Hitzberg, who is joining online, I hope. Karin, are you there? She might have had some issues with the technique. OK, then let's wait for Karin. Maybe she will join at one point. So I will call. Yeah, maybe we can move the chairs. This is a good idea. So Francis and Maraki, you are with us, right? Yes, they are. OK, perfect. Perfect, I'm seeing you. Hi, Francis. <laughs> Then we have here in the room uh, other panelists, and one of them is Roslyn. <laughs> Roslyn Fosua Ujei is from Ghana. She is the director of the Climate Change Division in the Forest Commission in Ghana. Welcome, Roslyn. It's a pleasure to have you here. And the second panelist is Eileen. Please, Eileen. So Eileen Bayana Cunningham, very nice to have you here and to see you. It's a absolutely a pleasure always to have you in a panel. Uh, she belongs to the Skito people, and she is a research and advocacy officer of KDPE. And KDPE, and I apologize my Spanish, Eileen, this is the Centro para la Autonomía y Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas. Is it correct? <laughs> this is my first sentence in Spanish. So really a pleasure to uh, have you here. I don't know if we have Carlos. So we have a third panelist who is Carlos Noberi, a scientist from the Sao Paulo University in Brazil. He is coming from another uh, side event, so hoping that he will join us in, in a minute. So Marlene and Roslyn, really a pleasure to have you here. So I will start maybe with Roslyn. What do you think about what you heard today? Particularly, you know, the very, very important role Ghana is playing in the forest agenda globally. Thank you very much, Huria. And uh, good afternoon to everybody here. I, I hope that Sham is treating all of us well in the second week of COP27. Um, um, to begin with, um, I want to hugely appreciate the FAO, particularly Maria Kay, for the support that um, FAO has given to Ghana. Um, if Ghana is announcing our first Red Plus credits, it is because we have had a lot of MRV support from the FAO, particularly um, through Maria Kay and her team. They've taken us step by step through our methodology, understanding um, the reconstruction of our reference level, getting into the performance, even for the different um, intervention areas we have in our Red Plus program, that's for the Cuckoo Forest area. So thank you very much, Marike, and thank you to the FAO, and thank you also to the World Bank that made this possible by fostering such a partnership. I believe we've had very great presentations, and um, they really reflect what is happening in country. Uh, Marike spoke about like the different um, avenues for putting out um, carbon credits there and how you can channel payments. Um, I see all of them as really being resource-based payments because even under the voluntary market, um, through LEAF, all that we are talking about is resource-based payments. Um, you have to demonstrate um, to be able to receive the payments. And the science, absolutely, as Francis put it, um, the science has been clear. It's even clearer now that we have added benefits that we need to pay for. And eventually, I believe that leads into the issue of pricing. Um, at the moment, what we have as a price for Ghana through the carbon fund is $5 per ton. The voluntary market is offering $10 plus, And um, that offer is not coming with any specific upfront financing. It's not coming with um, specific support for capacity or um, building. And it's very important for me to mention here that when we talk about resource-based financing, 
It's not just about generating the carbon. A lot of things have to be done to generate a ton of carbon, particularly for the forest sector. It's not like the energy sector. Um, within the energy sector, if you have some rural community um, project or even urban community project, you know your households, um, you have some um, solar panels, um, you can directly just attribute. For forest carbon, it's huge. These are huge landscapes. Um, with um, diverse people, diverse interests. You have private sector, you have local communities, traditional authorities, within customary systems of tree tenor, land tenor, um, how to even aggregate communities. That should all count for what it takes to generate a ton of carbon. So the discussion really on the voluntary side, um, when price is mentioned as $10, um, for Ghana we defer on that because we have to pay a lot of different things. Cost of validation and verification, which for example, the FCPF takes care of, and so it's not part of the $5 price. The cost of um, the grant process, the piloting process, they are all huge pieces. And eventually I end up with um, Amy's presentation on the adaptation, which I think is huge, and focus on the governance aspects. And linking that again also to what Francis uh, mentioned, it's not just carbon, not just the science aspect, but the governance. As I've gone around in COP27, I've heard a lot of local communities and indigenous people say, we want to see how the funds get to the communities themselves. No intermediaries, no middlemen or women. How do we structure governance? It's very important. And that should also even feature into the pricing. Because to have governance well laid out, is a plus. Some countries are still trying to figure this out. Some countries have, and there is a lot of opportunity for exchange and learning. For example, in Ghana, we have governance that is different from how the forestry sector has treated royalties in the past. We have been able to aggregate communities, and they themselves have set up their own governance structures with their own management boards, have opened their own bank accounts, are going to receive carbon payments directly into their accounts. And under the FCPF, the benefit sharing plan that we have, gives communities 69% of payments directly. They have a work plan, there are control measures on how funds will get to different community groups, not just the management boards. And when we talk about not just carbon, when we talk about the adaptation aspect, these are some of the features that we should begin to champion globally. Because MRV is there with the methodology to give you what it is, a ton of carbon, how you are generating um, within a particular landscape, but how that ton manifests in the lives of the people who have generated as the beneficiaries is the next big piece that I believe is fitting into all this discussion and the different presentations. And um, my take home is that I think we are on the wrong, sorry, we are on the right path and we should see how we are able to escalate that right path and give forests that global feature beyond just quantification of carbon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Roslyn. Really, very crucial point you are kind of pointing, you know, on uh, on the discussion, and particularly from the specific Ghana experience of, you know, how are you managing this payment and how you link that actually to the livelihoods of the people who are there producing that ton of carbon. So this is extremely important. Thank you very much for that. So Eileen, now I am coming to you. You have heard, you have a mic? Ah, great, that's nice. So we have seen really kind of, as Amy was saying, a lot of engagement from the indigenous peoples and this is really absolutely amazing to see. But we still have a lot of challenges. And what I think here really is like, what talking here, what Francis and Maraca and uh, Amy presented is taking us to something holistic, like a holistic view of the resources we are using. But you know, as from the indigenous people perspective, this is what, is, what it is, right? So wh what is your take from all what you heard today and how from the indigenous people's perspective? Thank you, and I want to, to how you say, up. I really appreciate, I forget some words in English sometimes, I really appreciate that Amy and FAO has invited me today to this, to this panel. And 
One of the first things, uh, as Amy say, one of the important things during this COP for indigenous people is that we are really a huge, I think it's a huge delegation of indigenous people from the seven sociocultural regions. I think we are more than 200. And even we are not all in, in the negotiation, there are different ways of negotiation and we are doing this. And why we are here is because most of the decisions that are, that are going to came from this are going to affect in one way or the other our lands, territories, and resources. And I just want to say thank you to the three researchers because um, we think all this information is really valid for us as indigenous people, also to local communities. We need research, we need data to to also advocate to our governments and other allies um, because then we saw where are these gaps, where are these lagoons of information and what is going on in our lands and territories. Also, I think, I really think in the first um, study that Maraike have present, um, it's really important that all this information is really technical. And for us, it's the representation of what is lack. It's lack all this participation of people that are engaged. Because we are, um, the information is talking about the emission reduction. And the governments are doing actions around market, voluntary and not voluntary market carbons. But who are? the one who are um, taking care of the areas that are um, capture all the carbon. In our case, it's indigenous people. So this information is also lack at national level. Uh, Marike show about all this NDC, and I was thinking, where are the indigenous people in the NDCs? Most of the country are not included in the just people and the NDC, so our contribution has been silent in all the global discussion. And indigenous people in the international arena and also at national level, we say that we want to be in the national plan of adaptation, the national plan of mitigation, because we are contributing to tackle climate change. And Yes, we are not there. If we are not there, so in studies that are really important, I think it's very important, the, 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 the result of Maraike research. But also, the, you can see that indigenous people are not taken into account. In, and yes, I also agree with Seymour about forest is not just carbon. And it's, it's so good that now the scientific are bringing this to the table of of negotiation because indigenous people have been saying that forest is not just carbon. For indigenous people, forest is our space of living, the space of reproduction of our culture, is the space where we have our sacred um, space. So it's beyond that, it's beyond carbon. And, um, and this is also, we, we are happy that this came now in this research because we had bring it, raising this in the advocacy process always. Also, there is, you have to accept that there is this overlap between indigenous people, land, territories, and the well-preserved natural areas. And these well-preserved natural areas are those areas that people are looking for mitigate climate change. Um, also, I think it's, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing that came with, with Francis was about, um, there was this part about finance. And I think it's very important because indigenous people have raised in that indigenous people want to be part of the process, like allies, like partners. And finance is one of the things that we are missing still. And not only finance, but direct access to the funds in different space. And lastly, but not least, is the study that Amy present right now. And I, I'm really happy that you say 
forest-based solution because we have here nature-based solution here and then you see the principle of nature-based solution and you see there is no indigenous people including all this so and you now in this study you have raised that are indigenous that are rate based based approach that normally in all this all this discussion of nature-based solution is missing so um i think at least these three studies is going to a good path. But we still have a, a lot of challenge. Challenge like really not only because there is these studies, good outcome, good result, but the idea is how we translate this to the negotiation, how we translate this to policies at national level to be this rights-based approach, to be holistic, inclusive, that also indigenous people and other communities could be in all the cycle process of all these actions. So um, that's are my, my remark on this, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. I think you brought all, you know, the right point. We, need, we, need, we still need to address, you know, moving from the science to, to uh, policy and to praxis and also to negotiations that, you know, right based approaches, like based on what we heard from Francis, that this actually should be now at the heart of, of the negotiations. Thank you very much. So now I'm moving to the audience and uh, I would like to take some questions or comments or whatever you have to say for Francis, Mike, Eileen, uh, Amy, and also for Roslyn. Okay. One question here. I think you, you, and you. Okay. Can you please introduce yourself and then your question? My name is uh, Moses Amma. I'm the focal person for the Red Plus program in Nigeria. Uh, let me first uh, appreciate the presentations that we had, but I picked something that is going to resonate even when I go back, that the forest too need adaptation. This connected very well with me. You know when you begin to talk adaptation, it looks as if it's adaptations for us alone. If the forest gets adapted, gets good adaptation, we are even better for it more. So this is very insightful, and I'm really impressed, impressed with that study you're going on with. Then I want to add my word to what Rosalind said. You know, we talk of carbon. And if we really want, if not because we are all in it, if the 1.5% goes beyond, we will not respect developed or developing countries. When it begins to fight back, it will touch all of us. So truly, the investment in the process of getting the carbon, if we want to put all the analysis like Rosalind did say, looking at you know, the diverse landscape, the implications, the unseen circumstances that you didn't you know, factor in, and you want to put a price to it, you'll be sure that the prices will begin to change even in real time. So, but because we are making progress, there are improvements, there are things we are learning, and everybody is ready to look at what challenges are. Where the carbon issue started, we didn't really understand them. The, the understanding is becoming clearer. We are looking at areas to focus on. So, but the message is that, is it something to continue on? Yes, it is. Are there areas that we have not understood well? Yes, there are areas we have not. Do partners and financing organizations need to begin to put this even in their budgeting? Yes, they should. While they put this price of $5, $10, they should begin to say, look, in the coming times, things will really change because we must do and help the communities to be committed to not allowing leakages to come along the line. Because if we allow this, you will get to a point that they can say, we can't carry it any longer. So I, I want to, again, recognize 
Marike is being a He's been very, and his team, very technical in taking us through the process. I can tell her that uh, what they did to the Nigerian team, we want to test ourselves to see whether we learned well, and they, they should keep it up in strengthening the capacities within countries to understand the MR process. Thank you and your team. We are very grateful, and we trust FU will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your supporting uh, uh, words. I know I have other questions here, but uh, we have no Carlos Nobere with us. So welcome. We have been missing you here. And we imagine how you, you might have been looking for the place here because it's very difficult to find the place. So welcome. And I will just give you the mic right away to her about you know, you were not here in the presentations, but I'm sure that you, you know very well the three uh, publications, you know very well what Francis was presented. So I would just like to hear from you, what do you think about, you know, these extremely interesting results and how do, what do you think, how can, can we move forward with them? So please, I will give you the mic. <coughs> Good afternoon to all. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I was late. I was in another meeting very related to this forced climate solutions. And I will say a few words about the Amazon. Uh, of course, this is true for all global, uh, global tropical forests, all forests, but particularly the global tropical forests, uh, the importance of keeping the forest, keeping the trees for climate stability. Uh, you know, globally speaking, all tropical forests, they have more than uh, 600 billion tons of carbon. So we have to keep it for climate stability. And unfortunately, deforestation, except perhaps Indonesia in the last few years, is increasing in tropical forests in Africa. In the Amazon, uh, more than 25,000 square kilometers are being cut every year. 30, 40,000 square kilometers under several stages of degradation. So there's a tremendous risk. So the Amazon forest is very close to a tipping point of becoming a degraded ecosystem. So that's why forest climate solutions is absolutely urgent to stop deforestation, uh, degradation, and then what's the economic potential? And this is something that uh, uh, it's very important for food, food security. Uh, of course, when the Europeans came to the Americas 500 years ago, particularly in South America, in the Amazon, in the Atlantic rainforest, they did not see any value in the forest. That's very interesting, a kind of a cultural uh, value that was they brought the food systems in Europe, mostly cattle. Cattle is responsible for 65% of all deforestation in the tropical forests in the planet. So the indigenous people in South America, they use hundreds of products. They, would, they had very safe food, food security, but they were abandoned. And then in the, let's say, the Atlantic rainforest, it's the forest 82%. The Amazon now, it's... 18% uh, deforest, 18, 17% degraded. So basically, do we really we need to deforest to produce only one product? Meat, soy, soy is animal farm. Uh, so I think the question is, the potential of the tropical forest, even for food security, is much, much larger. Keeping the forest standing the, uh, for instance, indigenous people, even today in the Amazon, they use hundreds of products. They, they have food security. And also, because of keeping the forest standing, is a tremendous uh, health uh, benefit, health safety. There is no pandemic originated in the Amazon for thousands of years. Place like in Africa, Indonesia, uh, Southeast Asia, with the largest number of microorganisms. Some other uh, pandemics originate in other tropical forests, but not in the Amazon. So that's why I say uh, how important it is really to keep the forest standing, to start changing our habits, 
to really to make use, to give value to hundreds of forest products for our food security. So that's the idea. We are proposing important uh, new development, sustainable development, nature-based sustainable development pathways for the Amazon. Uh, starting with a large-scale restoration project, we launched yesterday a size panel for the Amazon to restore more than 500 million, 50 million hectares, and then to develop a new economy we call standing forest, flowing rivers, by economy, you know, bringing value, adding value to hundreds of forest products. So we have, we want this economy to benefit the, all the Amazonian people, but also to benefit food security with food diversity for all of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for bringing the issues of food security and how important it is, you know, to keep the forest standing also for agriculture and for food security of, of uh, indigenous people living there. I have, I think one question was here. Okay, I think it was here and, oh, uh, no, sorry, it was you. I'm sure, I saw it. All right, so hi, I'm Veronica. I'm from the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research and we're an, an action-oriented research for development funder. Um, and so I've got some new projects in development that are very much about localizing um, these sorts of approaches, but with a particular emphasis on livelihoods, because very often where it goes wrong is, is actually that we're not recognizing what the local people really want and value and need out of the landscape. And there might need to be trade-offs there in terms of the intactness of the forest and the biodiversity, particularly when it comes to, say, restoration. I'm not advocating for degrading forests, to, yeah. Um, so I really appreciate all of that. And so I wanna go kind of straight to a question that's actually about um, being really future focused here. So when it comes to trees and forests, we need to be thinking about the, the long-term sustainability of what we're doing. Um, and yet, like in Australia, we've done a lot of analyses about biodiversity change under climate change, accelerating climate change. And all those analyses show that, you know, by 2050, 2070, um, actually our native ecosystems are, are expected to be under pressure to really look very different. Um, dominant species are expected to shift their ranges. Um, and so how do we do this with an eye on generating benefits now, but also recognizing w what species and what ecosystem are actually gonna be there in the future? Uh, thank you very much. So I, I have one, two questions, but please be very brief. So ask the question, then I will give the floor to the people to answer, and then we have to close. Thank you. I am uh, Dunia El Khurim from Lebanon, representing a woman association in Der Al Ahmar in Beka. And I'm very happy also to represent the weekend, weekend initiative from the FAO, which is a platform uh, for uh, about uh, 200 women from six countries that are coming together through the FAO uh, to, to exchange experience, to learn from each other. So please, we need that uh, to spread the benefits of the forest for those women which are at grassroots, supporting, uh, supporting them to be able to be really the guardians of the forest, because the woman is the guardian of the forest. So please, we, we need to have the woman in these strategies to support and to spread and to exchange experience and speak about the uh, economic benefits of the forest because when we have economic forests, uh, especially when we are in vulnerable areas, so we will protect our forest and it will be fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gender issues, this is really important. Thank you for highlighting. Thomas, you are the last one to ask a question, please. Um, thank you very much. My name is Thomas. I work with um, Rosalind at the Climb, uh, Forestry Commission. And Mareke is the star today, so let me add on. Mareke, <laughs> thank you very much. Just listening to the presentations, and I want anyone's take on this. Um, the relationship between f uh, forest and carbon, I think we've moved past that. That indeed is very important. But now the science is coming out. Frances presented it so well. And 
how do we now begin to communicate practically um, things beyond just forest and carbon so that it's always on the agenda? So we don't, anytime you mention forest, it's not just the carbon component that we are looking at, that we move from the science to the policy and bring it home so that it's always on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Francis, did you hear the questions? Yes. So. Please, go ahead. Can you address a few of them? Thank you. Um, I think there are others competent to, to um, respond to some of the more ecological uh, questions and, and um, local livelihoods and gender issues. So let me pick up on Thomas's point um, and try to make a linkage between that one, Mar Marika's presentation, um, and Rosalind's discussion about pricing. And, and before I go further, I just want to say how great it is to have the C4 band back together with Julia, with Amy, with Marika. Um, so really appreciate being here. So um, if you recall in Mareka's presentation, you know, she was showing the shift in availability of, of forest carbon credits and the bubble shrank when you start applying a stringent standard like art trees. And the reason for that is that nature-based solutions are seen as particularly risky. And so forest carbon credits, you have to have deductions for uncertainty and deductions for risk of impermanence and deductions for risk, risks of leakage. And so the, the volume of credits gets smaller and smaller. But especially in these discussions of voluntary carbon markets, nobody is giving those same credits benefits for um, the, the, the valuation for the upside benefits of, of forests, which are all the ones that, that I detailed um, uh, in my presentation and specifically for global cooling. So in theory, you could translate these cooling benefits into CO2 equivalents, you know, to you know, amplify um, the, the value of those carbon credits being, being um uh, generated. And so um, I do believe that that there's more that we can say um, in terms of pricing in the voluntary carbon market, but also potentially in reporting in the framework of the UNFCCC. And I think there's room for individual countries, and maybe it's using this new um, FCLP platform that Ghana is exercising leadership in to work with the IPCC and pilot some methodologies for actually quantifying some of these global cooling benefits of tropical forests so that they're sort of entered and entered into and, and recognized by the formal process, as well as in the context of the voluntary carbon market, um, both as the additional cooling benefits, but also the additional attributes related to um, local adaptation and resilience. So let me stop there. I know we're short on time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Francis. We heard you very well. And uh, I, I don't have so much time for my closing remarks because we are over time a little bit. But let me just thank all of you, thanks my speakers who are far away. I wish you were here, Francis and Mareke. Thanks also the panelists who really kind of addressed the issue of moving from science to praxis and to policy. And I think we are moving in the right direction but there is still a lot to do. So I hope we can do it together as, as a community of practice and that we join office, uh, forces that we move forward to a more holistic and integrative forest uh, in climate change. Thank you everyone and see you around.